Welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome to the EKG of the Week. I hope you're having a wonderful week, and I'm glad you could join us. So this week's case is an 85-year-old male with a history of hypertension and COPD that presents with shortness of breath. His presenting EKG is shown here. Before we get started, let's review the approach we've been using to interpret the EKG. So notice we have the patient's clinical presentation and then the EKG below it. On the right side of the screen, you'll see that we have a list that we'll go through before making a final interpretation. First, there's the regularity of the rhythm. That is, are we dealing with a regular or irregular rhythm? If it's irregular, is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? Next, we have the heart rate, in which we simply want to determine the rate of the rhythm. Then we have to look at the rhythm origin. That is, where in the heart is the rhythm actually originating from? Then we'll look at the uh, ventricular or QRS axis, which could help us with our differential diagnosis. And then there is the atrial, atrioventricular, and intraventricular conduction, looking at if conduction is normal or abnormal in any area of the heart. Then we have the waveforms, which would be all the waves, the segments and intervals, and lastly, anything else, meaning is there anything else that we've missed or still need to mention, where we'll look at the R wave progression and transitional zone in the precordial leads. After that, we'll use all the information that we've gathered to make a final interpretation of the EKG in front of us. And as always, we will compare it to a previous ECG uh, to make sure that the one that we're looking at here doesn't have any new changes from a previous one. Now I want you to pause the video and take a few minutes to go through it yourself. When you're ready, start the video and we'll go over it together. All right, so our 85-year-old male with a history of hypertension and COPD presents with shortness of breath in the following ECG. Let's go through it. So first, what is the regularity of the rhythm? Well, on first impression of the EKG, you probably notice that the rhythm appears irregular. And that is correct. In fact, this is an irregularly irregular rhythm. Okay, so this is an irregularly irregular rhythm. That's how I'll uh, denote it here. So what we do, and oftentimes you can use any interval you want, we'll often use the R to R interval, which is from one R wave, okay, to the next. Remember the R wave, the first positive deflection of our QRS complex, often after a P wave. So this is the R to R interval, okay, and then we look at the next R to R interval. You can already see that these are different, and because they're different, all right, and there's no pattern to why, how they're different. We call it an irregular, okay? And there's no regularity to the pattern whatsoever, right? All these are completely different, so we call it irregularly irregular. All right, so how about the heart rate? Well, because we have an irregular rhythm, we can estimate the rate of this, okay? We can look at the ventricular rate, we'll do here, by adding up the complexes going across the EKG, multiplying it by six, okay? Because we know the standard 12 lead ECG, which we're looking at in front of us, represents 10 seconds in duration, okay? So just so you're aware, from beginning all the way to the end is 10 seconds. 10 seconds times six is 60 seconds, which is one minute. So if we count these ventricular complexes, so these here going across, we'll get, and then multiply it by six, we'll get the, an estimate of that rate in beats per minute. So let's do that here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, okay, and 20. So we have 20 complexes, we multiply that by six, and we get a rate of about 120 beats per minute. Now the machine gave us a rate of 122 beats per minute, which is close enough, and we'll take that. So hopefully that makes sense, all right? So let's just clear this up. So 122 beats per minute is our ventricular rate. You can also find the atrial rate by doing the same thing and just counting up the P waves, all right? You can use the T waves and also use that to find the ventricular rate as well. Now let's look at the underlying rhythm origin. So we have narrow QRS complexes, so we know that this is a supraventricular rhythm or one originating from above the ventricles. We can also make out clear defined P waves in each lead, although these P waves morphology are not exactly the same in each. In fact, there seems like there's at least three different P wave morphologies, okay? And therefore, we're likely dealing with an atrial rhythm not originating from the sinus node. So if you look here at lead two, notice that these P waves, these first three, are completely different, okay? Even different from these that follow it. And that may indicate that we are in fact not dealing with a sinus rhythm, okay? So we have an atrial rhythm because there's P waves present. We don't have a sinus rhythm because in sinus rhythm, we want the P waves to have similar morphology. And so 
uh, that should make sense there. Okay, but we have three different, or at least three different P wave morphologies, probably more than that here. So three different areas in the atria are starting the impulse in conduction uh, through down to the ventricles. Let's look at the ventricular or QRS axis, okay? And you should have gotten a normal axis. So this is actually normal. We'll go through why that's the case. And it was actually came out to negative two degrees, okay? So what you need to know here is that zero degree sits here. This is where positive 90 sits. Okay, this would be positive 180 degrees or minus 180 degrees if you went the other way. So that's where minus 90 degrees sits. Now we're dealing with an 85 year old male. We know that the normal axis in adults is negative 30, okay, to about positive 110. So all this is a normal axis here. This would be a pathological leftward shift, okay? This is extreme axis deviation or no man's land or right superior axis. This is right axis deviation here, okay? Now what we want to do and the leads I want you to keep in mind are leads one here and lead AVF and that's the positive end of each of those leads. So if you look at lead one, notice that our QRS complexes are upright, meaning that we're going towards the positive end of lead one. Okay, next we look at AVF, which is down here. And actually, if you were to look at positive and negative, the R to S wave, the R to S uh, ratio is about one, so it's isoelectric, okay? So if it was positive, we'd be going this way. If it was negative, it would be going this way, but it's isoelectric, so we're pretty much perpendicular to the AVF lead. Now, another lead that can help us confirm we have normal axis is one that comes here, and that's lead two, and it sits at positive 60 degrees. So lead two here is mostly positive compared to the negative deflection, putting us somewhere here. And as we noted, this is negative two degrees, okay? And it makes sense, AVF is the most isoelectric here. So perpendicular to that lead puts us at that ventricular axis. So normal axis at negative two degrees, okay? Now, how about atrial conduction? All right, well here, we want to often look at leads two and V1 because the P waves or atrial abnormalities seem to be most apparent in those leads. The P waves are present in both leads here, although as we mentioned earlier, they have multiple different P wave morphologies. And one thing to keep in mind is that we are assessing, when we assess for atrial enlargement, whether it's left or right, the proposed criteria that's out there assumes that sinus rhythm is present. And because we said that sinus rhythm is not present here, we cannot say anything about atrial abnormalities at this point, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And because of that, we have to say that this is indeterminate, okay? So we cannot say anything whether we have right or left atrial enlargement because we do not have sinus rhythm present. We said it's coming from the atria. Now, how about atrial ventricular or AV conduction? Well, in this case, we're looking at for any conduction delays as the impulse travels between the atria and ventricles. Because the majority of the PR interval generally represents AV nodal conduction, we look there. The normal PR interval in adults, which we have here, is between 120 and 200 milliseconds, or three to five small boxes, okay? Here, the PR interval is within normal limits, but we cannot say use what the machine is giving us because the PR interval has multiple, uh, we have multiple atopic atrial foci, therefore the PR interval will vary, okay? And we don't have a set defined. So we have different uh, atria that are fired, different foci in the atria. Because of that, we have different PR intervals, okay? But regardless, we can say this is normal because as the atria fires and gets down to the ventricles, it's normal. We have one-to-one -one atrial to ventricular conduction, and there are no drop beats. So in this case, we will say it's normal, okay? Because for every P wave that fires, we get a ventricular complex, okay? And we have no drop beats, all right? But you'll notice that the PR interval changes there. So normal um, AV conduction in this case, all right? Next, we have intraventricular or IV conduction. And here we're looking at the QRS duration or QRS interval, okay? The normal QRS duration in adults is between 70 and 110 milliseconds or two to three small boxes. The main thing we're checking uh, with intraventricular conduction is whether or not it, the QRS interval is prolonged. We can see narrow QRS complexes that appear within normal limits. And in fact, the QRS duration here was 98 milliseconds, helping to confirm that IV conduction is normal. Now note that the QRS duration will be the same for each beat, okay? Because everything below the AV node is occurring as it normally would with a sinus beat. The only issue is here is that we have different origins of the atrial beat. So even though the P waves are firing, you'll notice that our QRS complexes end up looking similarly, okay? So IV conduction is normal, we said here. And the width of it, we said, was 
98 milliseconds is within that normal limit range. Now, how about the waveform? So P waves, we said we had multiple varying morphologies. Therefore, we noted sinus rhythm was not present and could not say anything about atrial enlargement. There are abnormal Q waves present in V1 to V3. And then when we look at the lateral precordial leads, V5 and V6, we see these large R waves. The, so the combination of these in the setting of discordant ST segment and T waves suggests left ventricular hypertrophy. More specifically, the S wave uh, in V2, or more the Q wave here, and the R wave in V6, okay, are greater than 35 millimeters in amplitude, further suggesting that we have minimal voltage criteria met, okay? Now, these deep Q waves and loss of anterior precordial forces now suggest that we may have an anterior septal infarct as well here. So, V1 to V3, notice that we have these deep Q waves, okay? These are deep Q waves. And then this is an R wave, so this is an S wave that follows it. And then in V5 and V6, we have these big, tall R waves, okay? All right, and we're saying that we, this is suggesting left ventricular hypertrophy. So remember, the criteria that you should take away here is that an S wave, in this case, it's a Q wave, in V1 or V2, whichever is deeper, and we're saying V2 here we're using. So we take this Q wave here, and we count up these big boxes, two, three, Four, five, okay. If we add that, okay, to the R wave, the largest R wave in V5 or V6, okay, in this case we can use V6 because it's the uh, tallest here. So from top to bottom, okay, if that is greater than or equal to 35 millimeters, it suggests that we have criteria for LVH met, okay, the voltage criteria. So you can clearly see that we have one, two, three, four at least, okay, and you need at least seven big boxes, okay, or 35 millimeters to meet that. So we clearly meet that here, okay, so because of that, we will write that we have the LVH, the voltage criteria met, okay? We also noticed that we said we have discordance. So notice the what we mean is that the main QRS vector is up, and then we have ST segment depression and T wave inversion here, okay, which is going in the opposite direction. That's discordance, okay? And we call those secondary repolarization abnormalities, okay? And you see the same thing here. Notice that we have these deep Q waves, and then upright uh, ST segment and T waves, all right? So those are discordant things. And we also mentioned the deep Q waves in V1 to V3 to be aware of, because that may suggest that we have either an ongoing infarct or one that was prior, um, previously present. Now, there are some nonspecific ST, T wave changes that are present here, okay? Uh, and you can see those in lead one, so not really much, just flat T waves there. Okay, nothing to be too concerned of. The PR segment is not significantly depressed or elevated. The PR interval, we said, was varying in the setting of the multiple ectopic atrial foci. The QRS interval was within normal limits. The ST segment uh, is depressed in leads two and three, but less concerning because these are not contiguous leads. Okay, so lead three, here's lead three. You can see there's some depression there in the ST segment slightly, and same thing here in two, okay? But you don't really see that in AVF, and because they're not contiguous, you don't get too excited about that, okay? There's also some ST uh, segment depression. We mentioned in those lateral precordial leads. So these here we mentioned that were part of those discordant or repolarization abnormalities. Same thing with the ST elevation here that we saw in some of these leads here, and maybe also slightly, not so much in V4, but... Um, yeah, so those are those discordant changes, the repolarization abnormal, as we mentioned, and the setting of LVH, okay? And lastly, with the waveforms, I want you to be aware that the QTC, so QTC, which is the corrected QT interval, corrects for heart rate, okay? Often we'll use the Bazette formula the machine will use and set a standard rate of 60 uh, milliseconds, okay? Or 60 uh, beats per minute as the heart rate it uses, okay? You can also use the Framingham, but the QTC here was actually prolonged at... 516 milliseconds, okay? We have a male patient here. We normally wanted about 440 milliseconds or less, okay? And females, 460 milliseconds, all right? But when we get up around 500, we get a little concerned about giving certain medications. So that's something to be aware of in this patient, okay? So if the patient was nauseous, giving Zofran may not be the best idea. We don't want to precipitate any arrhythmia, uh, ventricular arrhythmia with that prolonged QT, okay? All right, so is there anything else that we're missing here?
Well, how about R wave progression, the precordial leads? Normally, the R wave amplitude should progressively increase from V1 to V5. In this case, it seems like that is not certainly the case. Okay, in fact, the initial R wave is pretty much absent until lead V4, and the poor this is poor R wave progression and suggests that we have poor antral septal forces. Okay, so just to uh, take this off so we can kind of clear this up. And what we're looking here in these last two things, the R wave progression and transitional zone, are in these precordial leads. So these leads here. And notice that in V1, we don't even have any R wave. Same thing in V2. And the R wave should normally increase. And then we start to see it here, okay, in V4, okay, and then you see a big increase in. Uh, V5. Normally it should slowly increase from V1 to V5 and because we don't see that we call this poor R wave progression and that means that we likely have poor antral septal forces. Remember the septal forces here in V1 to V2 and then the antral uh, leads all over V3 and V4 often including um, V2 as well. Okay, You can see that we have these poor antral septal forces. Okay, That's what the poor R wave progression likely suggests. All right. Lastly, we have the transitional zone. In this case, it seems that, that to occur between V4 and V5. So here's V4 and here's V5. Okay. Now, the transitional zone is simply the precordial lead where we go from QRS transitioning from being mostly negative to positive in those precordial leads with the actual transition area where the QRS is most isoelectric. Normally, the transition occurs between leads V3 and V4. If it occurs before V3, we call it a counterclockwise rotation or early transition. If it occurs after V4, we call this a clockwise rotation or late transition. Therefore, because the transition occurs uh, to be somewhere between V4 and V5, we would call this a late transition or a clockwise rotation. Okay, so clockwise rotation or late transition. All right. Now, one thing to note and keep in mind with R-wave progression and transitional zone, these last two things, is that they're highly dependent on lead placement, which is certainly an imperfect science and technician dependent. So uh, be, care be careful how much you put into those things, okay? Make sure the leads are placed properly. Anyways, what's our final interpretation? Well, we have an irregularly irregular rhythm we mentioned, okay? We have a rate of 122 beats per minute, and we noted at least three different P-wave morphologies suggesting an atrial rhythm, okay? And that's originating from outside the sinus node alone. And these findings together give us a rhythm called multifocal atrial tachycardia, or MAT, okay? And multi-focal multi, uh, atrial tachycardia means when you have at least three different P-wave morphologies, the rate is over 100 beats per minute, as we see here, and it's an irregularly irregular rhythm, okay? Now, if the rate was less than 100, we would call that wandering atrial pacemaker, okay? So the only thing differentiating the two is the rate here, so above 100 beats per minute. So we have multifocal atrial tachycardia. We said we have a normal ventricular axis, AV nodal and intraventricular conduction were normal in this context. However, we noted evidence of uh, L LVH or left ventricular hypertrophy with secondary repolarization abnormalities, nonspecific ST T wave abnormalities, and a prolonged QTC interval. In addition, we saw deep Q waves and poor antral septal forces and a late transition, okay, or that clockwise rotation. All when taken together suggests we cannot rule out an antral septal infarct and we need to add the clinical context and review a previous ECG if available. When reviewing the patient's previous ECG, what we see is actually those deep Q waves are there, okay? And the only new change that we see here is sinus rhythm is no longer present and it's replaced with multifocal atrial tachycardia, okay? So just to review, we have multifocal atrial tachycardia. We said we have left ventricular hypertrophy with secondary repolarization abnormalities, okay? We also mentioned that we have a prolonged QTC, that's important to be aware of, okay? Uh, we also mentioned that we have nonspecific ST, T wave abnormalities, okay? And the other thing here, we said that we cannot rule out an anteroseptal infarct, okay? Because of the clockwise rotation, those poor R wave progression, and those deep uh, Q waves, all right? And then when we said, when we looked at the previous ECG, those were actually there, which is reassuring, okay? And the only thing we saw is that sinus rhythm is no longer present. So sinus rhythm uh, no longer present, replaced with this multifocal atrial 
tachycardia. Okay, so that's the rhythm that's replaced it. Now, one last thing to point out is that the patient has this new onset multifocal atrial tachycardia, and this can be seen in COPD as our patient has here, okay, and congestive heart failure. It is often seen in these ill elderly patients with respiratory failure, which may have been the case in our patient here, okay, presenting with shortness of breath and COPD. Now, multifocal atrial tachycardia tends to resolve after we treat the underlying condition, but it can be a sign of poor prognosis if it develops in the acute setting. All right, so let's wrap up our case here. So our 85-year-old male with a history of hypertension and COPD presenting with shortness of breath has this EKG showing multifocal atrial tachycardia, evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy with secondary repolarization abnormalities, a prolonged QTC interval, nonspecific ST, T-wave changes, and that we cannot rule out the anterior septal infarct, but when we look back at the previous ECG, they are there, and all we have is sinus rhythm no longer present, replaced by multifocal atrial tachycardia. Well, that's the end of this week's EKG of the week. I hope you learned something. Please don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below if you like what we're doing. In fact, many of you have asked how you can help us out. Really, the best way would be to simply subscribe and share this resource with your friends. You get free access to more than 300 videos. There's also a community of over 150,000 of us like-minded individuals on Facebook. So stop over and join the EKG Guys Facebook community. If you need a crash course on EKGs, we launched our new EKG course. Check the link below if you're interested. The original cost is around $100. $150, and I believe I made it less than $20 for a limited time. I may be biased, but after reading nearly every EKG textbook on the market, I think this is by far the best EKG series to take you from the beginner level to a physician level. I've even included our pediatric lectures. Anyways, check it out for yourself. I think you'll really enjoy it, and a number of medical schools and hospitals are beginning to use it. If you are a part of an institution, please contact us because we're giving a limited number of schools and hospitals free access to provide feedback and improve our course. And in that case, you can get the course for free. So leave a comment below and get in touch with us. And of course, check out our brand new website ekg.md, the premier EKG resource for medical professionals, where you can find more lessons and practice. That is www.ekg.md. Last but certainly not least, your feedback is incredibly helpful and your kind words are always an encouragement on those long days. So let us know how we're doing. Thank you again for your support. It is truly appreciated. We're the largest, fastest growing EKG resource in the world.